Dear learners, welcome to Legal Awareness Program of Odisha State Open University. I am Mayank Tiwari from National Law University, Odisha. I am taking the Commercial Laws and Unit 7 which is dealing about the basics of Commercial Laws. Already in the last video lecture, we have discussed about certain topics including the contract, its meaning and definition. We discussed about the agreement, how the agreement is formed, it is having the proposal and acceptance. We discussed about the parties to contract and enforceability by law. In the Today's video lecture, we are going to discuss about the essential features of contract, the consideration, the free consent of parties. In free consent of parties, we will be discussing about coercion, undue influence, fraud, misrepresentation and mistake. And lastly, we will be discussing about capacity to contract. Starting from the essential features of a contract, as already discussed in section 2 clause H, the term contract has been defined. It is defined as contract is an agreement enforceable by law. So only the agreements which are enforceable by law are contract. It can also be said that all agreements are not contract but all the contracts are agreement. The essential features of the contract are provided by section 10 of Indian Contract Act 1872. It provides that all agreements are contract if they are made with free consent of parties, competent to contract, for a lawful consideration and with a lawful object and are not hereby expressly declared to be void. All these features are very important in regard to a contract. And to become a contract, the agreement must compose of all these essential features. Now just analyzing all these features. The first is the free consent of the parties. Second is the agreement must be there. Third is the parties must be competent. The fourth is lawful consideration must be there. Fifth is there must be lawful object and lastly it must not be expressly declared to be void. Now summarizing all these uh, essentials of a valid contract one by one we can see that there must be a valid proposal and acceptance. So to form an agreement there must be a proposal followed by its acceptance. In the last video lecture we have discussed about the term proposal and its acceptance. The second is there must be the intention to create legal relationship. If the parties not have the intention to create legal relationship, definitely a contract cannot be formed. It is one of the essentials to form a valid contract. Let's suppose when a husband promises to the wife to give her or to present her a ring on a particular day, but he is not giving the ring to that lady, his wife. In this case, the wife cannot enforce the contract against the husband. When A promises to B to meet over a dine or to have a walk, in these cases also it is not an enforceable promise. It is merely a social arrangement. Social arrangements are not enforceable. Coming to the next, there must be free consent of the parties. We will discuss in detail what is the free consent of the parties and how the free consent is obtained. The next one is the consideration must be lawful. The lawful consideration is required to form a valid contract. The next is the object of agreement must be lawful. So when the consideration is lawful, it must be followed by the object. Object is an important criteria of a contract. Followed by it, it shall not be expressly declared to be white. When law is expressly declaring certain kind of the agreements as white, definitely these kind of the agreements cannot become a contract. The meaning of the agreement must be certain. It is very important. Many a time the meaning of the terms agreed between the parties are not certain. In this case that agreement cannot become a contract. Let's suppose when A agrees to supply different quantity of the items to B but it is not clearly providing what items are to be supplied to B. In this case the terms are not clear. Let's suppose we can take another example when A is a merchant selling different kind of oils. In this case, he may be selling the mustard oil, he might be selling the sunflower oil, he might be selling the coconut oil. He just quoted to B, I will supply you oil at rupees 500 per barrel. In this case, it is not clear which oil is being supplied by A to B. So terms of the agreement must be very clear to make it a contract. 
the last one is the agreement must be possible to be performed so when one party agrees to perform some something which cannot be performed which is not possible to be performed if one person says to another i will pluck the stars from uh, the sky and give it to you whether it is possible to be performed but obvious a common person cannot do so a reasonable man can understand it is not possible so the agreement must be possible to be performed to become a contract coming to the next aspect of the essentials of a valid contract is a consideration consideration is essence of the valid contract uh, as already discussed in the term agreement an agreement is the promise or set of promises forming consideration for each other so we can say that in agreement the essence is a consideration consideration is something in return it is also termed as quid pro quo quid pro quo means something in return it is generally said that when there is no consideration no contract can be entered now moving to the definition of the consideration which is provided by the indian contract act 1872 section 2d provides that when at the desire of promiser we have already discussed who is a promiser the promisee or any other person again we have discussed the term promisee has done or abstained from doing or does or abstains from doing or promises to do or abstain from doing now this part of the definition includes that the consideration may be either present future or past all the three form of consideration are allowed as per the definition of the consideration provided by section 2d of indian contract act 1872 proceeding further such act or abstinence or promise is called a consideration for the promise please listen again it is when at the desire of promiser the promisee or any other person has done or abstained from doing or does or abstains from doing or promises to do or to abstain from doing something such act or abstinence or promise is called a consideration for the promise from this definition we can chalk out the features of the consideration coming to it the consideration is at the desire of the promiser and not at any other person's desire so essential thing is that the promiser must have the desire he must be providing what shall be the consideration how the consideration is to be paid the consideration may move from the promisee or any other person that as the consideration is at the desire of the promiser but it may be made by either promisee or by any other person on behalf of the promisee the consideration may be to do or to abstain from doing anything so here we can see that both positive and negative things are included if a person is given with the consideration to do something it is included as a consideration or even that person is restrained you must not do that thing it is also a consideration for the promise the consideration may be either past present or future as we have discussed in the definition it has been clearly provided that the person has done or abstained from doing or does or abstains from doing or promises to do or abstain from doing something so in india the consideration may be either past present or future the consideration must be real and not illusory the consideration must be lawful which is very important the consideration must not be same what the person is already bound to do these are the features of the consideration coming to the next concept of the free consent of the parties the term free consent is defined under section 13 of indian contract act 1872 as two or more parties are said to consent when they agree upon same thing in the same sense there must be consensus ad idem consensus ad idem means when two parties agree upon same thing in the same sense there shall be free consent of the parties free consent is very important for a valid contract and the consent is said to be free when it is not caused by coercion undue influence fraud misrepresentation or mistake the consent plays an important role in formation of a valid contract now one by one we will be discussing all these things including coercion undue influence fraud misrepresentation and mistake the learners can find 
the detail concept in the self-learning material. Coming to the term caution first. Caution is defined under section 15 of Indian Contract Act 1872. The caution means committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by Indian Penal Code or an unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property to the prejudice of any person. These act must be done with a view to make any person to enter into contract. The caution may proceed from any person and may be directed against any person to make the person to enter into a contract. And the enforceability of the contract depends upon the willingness of the parties whose consent is not free. Therefore, these kind of contracts are voidable at the option of the person whose consent is not free. Before discussing it, I need to discuss about the voidable contract. What is voidable contract? Voidable contract is a contract which is enforceable at the option of one of the parties and not at the option of the other or others. Let's suppose, in case of the caution, if A forced B to sign an agreement on the gunpoint. Now, in this case, the force which is inflicted by A on B is prohibited by means of the Indian Penal Code. So, definitely, it is an offense or it is an act which is forbidden by the Indian Penal Code. Thereby, it comes under the category of the caution. It depends upon A whether he exercises his right to make the contract null or not. If he is not doing anything, definitely the contract will be a valid contract and it will be enforceable like any other contract. Coming to the next concept, it is undue influence. Undue influence is defined under Section 16 of Indian Contract Act 1872. The nature of relations subsisting between the parties in undue influence is of such a nature that one party is in position to dominate the will of another. It is the relation where the party has used such influence to make another to enter into the contract. Like the caution is the physical force, the undue influence is the moral force. When a person can dominate the will of another, it is the next question. So, when the first person hold the real and apparent authority over the another, for example, the relation between the master and the servant, definitely the person will be in position to dominate the will of the other. The second is when the person held the fiduciary duty towards the other. The fiduciary duty means the duty of ubrima fide, the duty of utmost good faith that is required to be protected by the parties. When the contract is being entered between the persons whose mental capacity is temporarily affected by the reason of old age, death or mental or bodily distress. These are the three categories when we can determine that the person can dominate the will of another. Moving to the next concept which is the fraud. The fraud term is defined under section 17 of Indian Contract Act 1872. The fraud is a willful representation made to deceive the other party and to induce that party to enter into the contract. When a person makes the statement knowing it to be false or knowing it not to be true, it may amount to fraud. The intention in the case of fraud plays an important role in determining the nature of statement. The acts which are covered by the fraud. Suggestion of the untrue fact. When one person makes the false statement, which that person doesn't believe to be true, when A thinks that the particular thing is not existing, and even he is making statement to B that this thing is existing, it means that he knows that the thing is not in existence. He is making the statement regarding untrue fact. The second is active concealment of the fact. So active concealment of fact in several cases the seller is responsible to inform to the buyer about the defects in the goods. And when it conceals the same, it amounts to fraud. Active concealment of the fact, it comes into the picture when there is a relation of utmost good faith between the parties. Otherwise also, when the fact is required to be disclosed in regard to particular contract, 
at that time also the active concealment of fact is an important criteria to determine whether it is a fraud or not. The next is the promise without any intention of performing the same. When a person is making the promise, but definitely he is not having any intention to perform the same. It means that the person has committed the fraud. Any other act fitted to deceive. Last one is any act or omission declared by law specifically as a fraud. So by any other provision of any other law, if any act is categorized as fraud, it is also covered as the term fraud. The next term is the misrepresentation. Misrepresentation is defined under section 18 of Indian Contract Act 1872. The misrepresentation is the false statement which is made without any intention to deceive other person. In case of the fraud, there was intention to deceive the person. But in case of misrepresentation, there is no intention to deceive another person. It is the statement made with the honest belief and without any knowledge that the statement is not true. For example, when A agrees to sell his horse to B for rupees 50,000 and the horse is already dead, there may be two cases. The first case, when the A knows that horse is already dead and he is making the statement that horse is fine and he is the horse is healthy. In this case, the person is committing fraud. But in another case, when A is not having any knowledge about death of horse and in spite of that, he agrees to sell the horse to B for rupees 50,000. In this case, the statement made by A to B for selling his horse was without any intention to deceive B. So, it can be termed that there is a misrepresentation in this case. Coming to the next topic, it is the mistake. The mistake is an erroneous belief, which is regarding either fact or a, regarding law. The mistake can be further classified broadly as the mistake of law and mistake of the fact. Mistake of law. The mistake of law is further classified in two categories. The first category is the mistake of Indian law and the second category mistake of foreign law. In case of mistake is regarding the Indian law, it shall not be an excuse for anyone and will not affect the validity of the contract. The contract shall remain enforceable because nobody can take the excuse that he or she don't know anything about law. So ignorance of law is no excuse. In regard to the mistake of foreign law, the same shall be treated like mistake of fact as the foreign law is required to be proved in Indian courts as the ordinary fact. So the mistake of the foreign law shall be the mistake of fact. Coming to the mistake of fact. The mistake of fact is when the parties have different notion in regard to the subject matter of the contract. The mistake may be either unilateral or bilateral. In case of unilateral mistake, Unilateral mistake is that mistake which is the mistake on part of one party. But bilateral mistake is mistake that is on part of both the parties. In case of unilateral mistake, the unilateral mistake is of no effect and the contract may be enforceable unless the mistake is of fundamental effect and the other party is aware of the same. Proceeding to the bilateral mistake. In bilateral mistake, where the mistake is on part of both the parties, the contract shall be void. Just coming to all these cases, in case of coercions, as we already discussed, it is defined under section 15, whereby one person, he is committing the act which is forbidden by Indian Penal Code. The consent is obtained by such an act. So, the consent of the person is influenced by the same. So, the contract is voidable at the option of that person. Likewise, in case of the undue influence, the person consent is not free. So hereby also the contract is voidable at the option of the party whose consent is not free. Third one is in the case of the fraud. Same in the case of the fraud also, the contract is voidable at the option of the party whose consent is not free. In case of the misrepresentation, the same thing is there. The contract is voidable at the option of the party. The last one is the mistake. We discussed in case of mistake, there may be mistake of law, there may be mistake of fact. And in case of mistake of law, if it is in regard to mistake of Indian law, there will be 
no effect on the validity of the contract. But in regard to mistake of foreign laws, it shall be treated as the mistake of the fact. We discussed that in case of mistake of fact, when the mistake is unilateral mistake, there shall be no effect to the contract and the contract will be enforceable. But in case of the bilateral mistake, the mistake is on part of both the parties and contract shall be void. The last one is in regard to the capacity to contract. The competency of the parties has been provided by section 11 of Indian Contract Act 1872. Every person is competent to contract who is of age of majority according to the law to which he is subject and who is of sound mind and is not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject. So accordingly we can say the capacity to contract the persons not competent to enter into contract are number one is minor. Minor is that person who has not attained the age of majority and as per the Indian Majority Act the age of majority is 18 years. The second is the persons of unsound mind and the third one is the persons otherwise disqualified from contracting by law. So in this case we can say that a special protection is provided to those parties who cannot take the informed decision about a contract. Thank you.